you should probably know that I've never done any public speaking before, and I'm very nervous, and I'm mainly reading. I'm also five and a half months pregnant, so however bad this gets, you definitely can't throw a few seconds. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a variety of things. To introduce myself a little bit more, I'm an information architect and I'm currently masquerading, as Mike said, as the lead user experience and design practitioner for the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Trust is an organisation that funds scientists, social scientists, product developers, product developers? Yes, product developers, performers, and many more to conduct research or enhance our understanding of human and animal health. And we also have a gallery and a library. My point is that we have lots of different websites, we have very different audiences with changing needs, we have a lot of messy, time-critical, narrative-based content that sometimes needs unexpectedly to connect. It has to be findable and it has to evolve. And despite that job title, I do describe myself as an information architect. And the reasons for this are pretty straightforward. It's the career that I set out to get, um, including getting a Master's in Library and Information Science in Science from this very university. And it's where I know my skills lie. I also have a morbid fear of being left alone to design any part of the interface. <laughs> so my job title always was Information Architect until I joined a digital agency who reinvented their IAs with all manner of different job titles, both formally and on the fly in pitch meetings. I, <laughs> I didn't pay too much attention to that at the time. I thought it was probably just the way that digital agencies worked. But I think perhaps I should have given it more attention because I haven't had the words information or architect in my job title since, and I think that has made a difference. My current job title is accurate insofar as I head up a team of user experience practitioners and interface designers, but it's not particularly accurate if you're looking at my job title as a reflection of who I am and what I'm good at. And I'm telling you this because I think it's important context for the rest of the talk. Um, I'm slightly confused about who I am. And I think perhaps a lot of IAs feel the same way, and possibly a lot of user experience people secretly feel that they don't understand information architecture. And I'm going to try and look at that a little bit today. It was mentioned to me by people reviewing this talk that I sometimes sounded like I was striking an us versus them attitude, and it wasn't always clear who was us and who was them. So to be completely clear, I'm very anti any kind of us versus them. I think the whole digital industry needs to be better at eradicating the us versus them attitude that it swims in. I think we all need to get better at defining our roles based on what's expected of us within a project and within a project team and valuing our relationships with those around us. So, relationships. I want to talk about a really important relationship. As an information architect, my favourite relationships tend to be ones between entities or elements of a classification system. But I am forced to concede that human relationships are pretty important to me, <laughs> even in So information architects have a mixed history with human relationships. When I started out, I remember there was a lot of emphasis in the, in the information architecture community about needing to seem less isolated. The overall picture painted was of these kind of lone wolf individuals hunched over their synonym rings, churning out wireframes, maybe leaving the office to drink alone and write startlingly inside the poems about <laughs> This image wasn't doing anyone any good. I was asked by two of my early mentors to consider my role as being that of a fulcrum or even a mediator. Bringing together, in person as well as on paper, the user, the business, and the technical. These three elements are almost naturally predisposed to buzz along without interacting with each other, and my role was to bring it all together. And I still believe that's a crucial part of what information architects do. But the problem is, I think we've lost our grip on one of those elements, the technical. I'm worried about our relationship with back-end developers. I think IAs used to have a really strong connection with back-end developers. I didn't realise it at the time, but my first job as an information architect was actually in some kind of digital utopia. We had teamers of IAs, we had interface designers, we had user researchers, copywriters, we had in-house QA testers, and large teams of front-end and back-end developers, not to mention, of course, project managers and product owners. We all had defined roles, although there was some flexibility, and we were expected to work together in multidisciplinary teams for the good of the product. And this was a long time before Agile got the capital A for the majority of the digital industry. So 
So I worked with the researchers and the analytics data to understand the problem, and I worked with the designers and the copywriters on the interface. But there's another step, and it's the most important one. As I said, this was my first information architecture job. I was very anxious to prove myself, but I fell into the working in isolation trap, although usually drinking in large groups and absolutely no insightful poetry. <laughs> I churned out my wireframes and their painstakingly detailed annotations and printed them off and gave them to the product owner to sign, sign off and then expected the pages to magically work exactly as I had imagined them to. But of course they didn't. So I whined to my boss. I've done all this work, I've created all the documentation, it went to the developers and I told them to get in touch if there were any issues and they never got in touch but they built it wrong. And my boss, very patiently with hindsight, asked me how much I'd spoken to the developers before I'd created the solution and done my wireframes, how much I'd spoken to them during the whole process, how many times I'd checked my decision making and assumptions with them. And of course the answer was no times at all, not once. And he pointed out to me that they were sitting about 10 metres away from where I was, and it might be worth crossing the floor and introducing myself. <laughs> so I crept over there and talked to my own shoes for a bit, until one of them took pity on me and asked whether or not they should call my mum. <laughs> but we got to the thing, and I explained that I designed this amazing flight search experience, which updated in a particularly snazzy way, and made sure the user always had the cheapest options with the fewest transport changes available on top of their filter. It was exactly what had been asked for in the research, and the interface designer and I had come up with a really whizzy way of presenting it. The staging site was not working as designed, it was a hot mess. Quite a large amount of back-end developers started looking at me like I was absolutely insane, and quite pityingly, they started to explain how we didn't just have one magic single system containing all real-time flight data. This information came from multiple sources, these were all refreshed at different rates. The systems, in some cases, belonged to other companies. We didn't have a lot of control over how they worked. It took time to get results, which is why flight search is supposed to take so long on applicators. This was horrible. The users would get really frustrated, and my busy feature of the amazingness would be awful. And I'd already sold it really hard to the product owner. So the back-end developers and I sat down and talked it over, and we came up with an idea together where the user could opt in. Potentially, this might be less annoying if they were getting what they wanted. It went through lots of iteration and lots of testing and eventually ended up being something slightly different. But the point is it was a solution that worked technically, it performed properly and helped the users who were interested in using it. Of course, after I'd mustered up the courage to do that once, things got a great deal better. I realised that the back-end developers were people I needed at the start of my thinking. They could and happily would tell me what was technically possible and what wasn't technically possible. It wasn't all sweetness and light, there was a great deal of, but why isn't it technically possible? But ultimately, I ended up learning a huge amount about the back-end systems we were working with and the other systems we were integrating with and how it all worked. It showed me that being scared of the back-end and of thinking that it was someone else's problem was completely self-defeating, and that made me a better information architect. I didn't make much promises to the business. I was able to look at the results of user research and understand what could be achieved quickly and know which things that looked like they might be a quick win would actually be a lot more trouble than they were worth. I had a really good working relationship with those developers. They really helped me. We became a family when there was something they thought I would be interested in. So not only was I a better information architect, but the products I was working on were better products. Sometimes they worked hard to try and make the impossible possible because I spent time with them and I'd explain why I thought a particular thing was a valuable feature. It doesn't mean they always succeeded, but they tried. In the agency job that I had, the first mobile app I ever worked on was for a national transport organisation. Bear in mind, bear, please bear in mind that this was a few years ago. Um, we had research indicating that users would value the get me home function, showing them a, from where they were standing to their front door group from when they were lost, tired and emotional, pissed. <laughs> <laughs> we needed the app to do lots of different things based on, based on lots of different sources of data. And quite a lot of these sources of data were themselves complex and a bit gnarly. It was the sort of feature that could very easily have been deprioritised due to its complexity over and over again. But I spent time talking to the developers and the product owner and we went through all the research and the user need and we sat down and we worked on the data model. <coughs> We knew we had all the pieces of the puzzle, we just needed to figure out a simple way of connecting them. And we hit a lot of walls, but eventually, thanks entirely to the persistence of the backend developer, the issues were surmounted and a usable solution was implemented. 
and I have the rare and delightful luxury of still overhearing people talk about how much they like it. I took those experiences with me to my next few information architecture roles, and for the most part, the structures and expectations for information architects and back-end developers communicating were already in place. It wasn't flawless, obviously, but it was a given that it was needed. So what changed? It's hard to know, but I really think it was the information architects and not the back-end developers. I think we got distracted. So the industry and our role within the industry started to change. And I firmly believe that change is normally positive and always inevitable. But I, that doesn't mean I don't get that it's very scary. Up until that point, apart from in places like the digital utopia that I mentioned earlier, nearly all elements of the user experience were part of the information architect's role. We were usually the only person thinking about and trying to justify UX. But then the user experience started to become a big thing, and quite rightly, and the industry started to realise that understanding and designing for the user made a big difference to the success of their products. And new roles grew out of this. And a lot of the things which were once reluctantly, in many cases, the remit of the information architect, became a lot part of a larger user experience process. So the wireframes, the personas, the user journeys, but if all of that is being done by someone else, what does that leave me, the IA, to do? But of course, what an information architect brings to the table is very different, and many UXs don't bring it. And that's the understanding of the metadata, the structuring of the information, the classification systems, the stuff we need to collect, and not just in the interface. And we need to understand, we understand, sorry, that a great experience comes from a sound structure, and we understand how to create these structures. We went through a big period of trying to figure out how these core IA skills, that back-end design work, fitted into both the team structure and the process. And oh my god, there were just years worth of conference presentations about how we fitted in, who we were. <laughs> it was very existential. <laughs> Meanwhile, in pursuit of better products, the industry remembered that they needed people who were great with copy and with communication. And they needed user researchers and interaction designers and it became crucial to look at all of these people's relationships with the front-end developers, especially as front-end technology changed and the possibilities increased. So the family of front-endiness has expanded a great deal over the last few years, and information architects have been very caught up in trying to get, not get lost. I think perhaps we were afraid of losing territory or not fully trusting other people to look after the things we had taken care of for so long, even if we didn't like taking care of them. And I'm not saying it's right, but it's certainly natural. And perhaps the front end started to feel impossibly glamorous in comparison to the back end. Certainly it's what the stakeholders notice and the prizes get given for. I've never had a member of middle management pause at my desk to compliment me on my control of the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> there have almost definitely been multiple causes, but the overall result has just been more confusion. Many information architects have become user experience generalists and haven't championed the skills that make them unique and valuable. I certainly spend more of my time than I would like being an uncomfortable generalist, and uncomfortable generalist, I have just decided, will be the name of my autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> We've drifted away from our connection with the back end. The back end developers, incidentally, have not been sitting around waiting for us to come back. No, they have been getting on with back end development. They do not worry about who they are, they have new systems and techniques to learn and invent. Existential crises are not how they roll. And this means that information architects are catching up to do. In some cases, we have to sell ourselves all over again. I've met back-end developers who have no idea what information architects or information architecture is and how they can help them. They're not being snitty, they're not being deliberately snitty. They just have no direct experience of working with an information architect. And I don't think this is their fault. Organisations very rarely have a dedicated IA anymore. Even when there is a person with those skills, they are often engaged over with the front-end team or in the research lab. Where information architecture has become a sub-discipline of UX, the rigour has been lost from the practice, and it's often viewed as some work the user experience practitioner does with the sitemap. A few things have made me realise that this is a problem. One of them has been talking to other IAs and overhearing them talk about their experiences. And also, worst of all, I realised that I've been very guilty of letting the relationship slide. When I started in my current role, I was a member of a four-person web team. There was a project manager, there was me, and there were two developers. 
And they both did a bit of front end and a bit of back end, but in general, they were working on a daily basis to prop up two old, no longer supported by the provider, crumbling content management systems, which the majority of our websites sat on. The three of us actually had a fairly good working relationship because there was very little in the way of a layer between us. They weren't really sure what I was for, and I was spending most of my time trying to get my head around the various limitations of these content management systems all the limitations, should you be interested, and realising that, as it stood, I wasn't really sure what I was for either. And then big and much needed changes began to happen, and over four years, our web team grew and changed massively in terms of what it could achieve. We had multiple user experience practitioners, designers, project managers, front-end developers, and back-end developers. We even have a new, dedicated content team for one of the sites. It's really different. But most of the focus in that growth has been around team processes and how the various elements of the front-end team work together. The back-end team, which is now four people with a wide range of skills, are working on their own processes and getting to know an open-source CMS that is new to three of them. And I feel like, in general, we've set a precedent of separate tracks of work, which is worryingly close to the sort of silos that I was trying to get away from at the start of this talk and the start of my career. Some of this may have grown out of trying to schedule sprints for front-end prototyping and back-end build. Everything starts to get thought about separately, despite the fact that for either of those phases to work and be successful, they need to be really closely linked. As a team, I think we're starting to realise that. I'm working at a project at the moment, and it's really clear to see that despite having lots of project structure in place, we've been struggling. We had a year of research and design and front-end prototyping, Actually, it was longer than a year. Um, before a member of the back-end team was made properly available to us. I now have it says a year, but longer than a year. Um, we were working on so many assumptions. It could have been a complete train wreck. It hasn't actually been that bad, but that's luck rather than judgment. We've had to spend a lot of time backtracking through decision-making processes and documentation to show the back-end developers why certain paths were taken. And as the back-end developer works through the prototype, they come back to us with things that are harder to do. I feel like I've gone full circle to that first job and it feels especially ridiculous because two years ago I worked on a project at the same place of work with the same people that went much more smoothly. We had the resources but we didn't have a great deal in terms of project structure and whilst that gave a lot of flaws we had a much better way of actually working. We created a long-form content site called Mosaic on Drupal content management system that at that time none of the in-house staff had worked with before. And we had an IA, myself, a designer, a front-end developer and a back-end back -end developer, all working in close collaboration. A variety of other people came in and out of our workroom and gave us guidance and support and insight, but I still think that the core of the success of the project was that we could talk to each other at any point. The back-end developer could hear all of the research findings that I brought back to the team and understand the rationale behind the architecture and interface design. We could all talk through the structure of the site and the URLs and the relationship between the types of content, which meant the back-end developer and I had a shared understanding of structure and approach, and the designer had a greater insight into the way everything was set up. It wasn't blissful. For starters, the room was really hot and fairly aromatic, but it worked for the product. <clears throat> I think we could learn from this to figure out how to mend the relationship between IAs and back-end developers. How do we stop returning to a place where people whose concerns and ways of thinking are so similar that they don't even walk in meetings to talk to each other? I think we need to start our work. <laughs> IAs need to move on from our confusing crossovers with interface designers and interaction designers and content strategists and user researchers and just make sure that whatever we're working on, whoever is on the team, everyone in that team understands what their roles are for that project. Personally, I'm never happier than when I get to work with my skilled interface designer, it takes the pressure off me in terms of wireframes and talking to stakeholders about look and feel and interactions. And if I can then brief an outside agency to conduct the bulk of the user research, then that's pretty good too, and I can concentrate on doing the things that I'm good at. We need to bring the back-end developers into the core team and get them involved from the start, make it second nature for the information architect and the back-end developer to be working side by side, or at least regularly catching up and sharing knowledge. Make sure time is factored in for this, make it the norm to have this time built into your project. 
it's a classic example of the sort of thing where the upfront cost is going to be worth it in comparison to the long-term cost of the floral product. I don't think we can afford to go back to a place where the back-end developer is the last person to understand the design and the intention. I put together a practical list of things to bear in mind. So number one, developers, whether they're front-end or back-end, are responsible for building the thing you've designed. Respect that this can be hard and that they can't read your mind. Two, if you're doing stand-ups or demos or any other meetings, invite anyone who's not yet working on the project but will be later to come along. It gives them an overview of what's happening and hopefully raises any issues nice and early. If you can, three, if you can't all sit together and work collaboratively, then make sure you have at least one really thorough information architecture back-end developer catch-up a week. If your developers are in another country or in another part of the same country as you, make the effort to contact them. If I can talk to my nieces in Australia once a week, you can talk to your dev team. <laughs> and it's not feasible to, if it's not feasible to talk to them all at once, then have a rep from the dev team who you communicate directly with and get the report back to the team. We can do this now, we have phones and everything. <laughs> Make the effort to learn, sorry, five. Make the effort to learn about the systems being used. It will help your work so much. Take the time to understand the building blocks of any content management system being used. This will give you so much control in the conversations that you have. Also, learn the terminology of any systems being used so that you all understand each other. Once you understand that what you call a module is not what the developers call a module or what the CMS calls a module, your life will get a lot easier. Six, if the back-end developers are scheduled on another project that overlaps with your project, then talk to the project management team or whoever handles those things <coughs> to get a bit of their time back so you can involve them in the meetings. Make this standard, try to make this standard. Seven, if your developers push back on being involved, find out why and persist. In the past, I've found that they are not perhaps used to being involved and find it weird, but once they are, they find it helpful. They also might misunderstand the level of involvement expected, so try to be clear that this won't be hours of meeting, meetings and that it's just trying to save time and effort in the long run, ultimately their time and effort. And finally, listen to them. They know stuff you don't and it's really helpful. Why is all this important? Why is information architecture an important element of user experience? And why is it important in terms of back-end development? Both information architects and back-end developers focus on structure, and structure builds meaning. Ernest Hemingway said one of these two things, depending on which source you use. <laughs> Prose is architecture, not interior decoration. Prose is architecture, poetry is interior design. So an analogy, an analogy. Stories. We tell stories. That's one interpretation of what we do. All stories need structure, or they just don't work. At its most basic, a beginning, a middle, an end. The reader needs the structure, the user needs the structure. Of course there are exceptions, but that's definitely another talk, probably another conference. It doesn't matter how long or short the story is. Again, possibly Hemingway, although Wikipedia questions the nature of the attribution, wrote this six-word story, please forgive the macabre nature of a pregnant lady showing this. <laughs> For sale, baby shoes, never more. That is six words, but it still has structure, and the structure is created by the choice of words, the order that they're in, and the punctuation. These elements make six words into a story with impact, poignancy, and darkness. With that darkness in mind, I don't have another useful slide for a really long time, but I felt bad leaving that there, so I'm just going to put this in. <laughs> <laughs> I can also fall back on our analogy with real world architecture. It would be like an architect trying to get a house built without talking to the builder. And of course, I'm talking about the structure here, the girders, the load-bearing walls, the number of stories, the roof, the foundation. The plans get handed over, the architect goes to a champagne reception, or a cocktail party, I hear that's what he goes to. And um, the builder is left scratching their head. Yes, they can make something from just looking at these plans, but there's no shared vision, there's no understanding. If they worked together, they would almost definitely have created something better. To emerge from an analogy world, it doesn't matter how big, small, complex or simple your product is, it needs coherent structure. It needs places for data to live and it needs metadata to describe that data. 
It needs classification systems. It needs consideration to be given to other systems it relies on. It needs fallbacks and fail-safes for all manner of errors. It needs to be created around the needs of the user and the possibilities available within the technology. The reason the connection between information architects and developers is important is that the back-end developers give function to our designs. I worry sometimes that there's still a perception that designers are more valuable than developers. This is not the case. Whatever the type of the designer, whatever the type of developer, we need each other. I've also discovered that products that have involved back-end developers throughout, throughout tend to perform better, both in testing and in the real world. On that project for Mosaic that I mentioned earlier, the back-end developer was highly engaged with the research and was able to make changes based on test findings rapidly. We found that after launch, apart from some cosmetic tweaks, we didn't have any major issues. There's a team working on that site right now, conducting <coughs> research again, two years in. But all of the changes are either about the interface or how the editors interact with the content management system. The overall structure of the product is still found. Information architects and back-end devs concern with a lot of the same things. But remember, it's perfectly possible for a website to get built without the input of an information architect. It would, of course, be a terrible website. But the point is they can do it without us, and in some cases they have been doing so for some time. We need to get back to a point where the back-end developers understand that their lives are better with us in it, and we understand the same thing about them. I think an excellent way of doing this is demonstrating that we both care about the same things, and that we think in similar ways, and that we know, we both know, that the underlying structure is the true reason that something, a house, a story, an app, a website, goes on to work well. Together, we come up with the rules and relationships that govern how the meaning within the product is constructed. This is the beginning of the user experience. The interface, no matter what it is, no matter how snazzy, is a window onto this structure and these relationships. So, we're nearly there. A final summary. We, information architects, need to get better at claiming and promoting our unique sets of skills. Digital professionals, sorry, need to be better at defining our roles on a project-by-project -project basis. Information architects are losing our connection with the technical element of our role. We need to get this back. Back-end systems and back-end developers aren't scary. They're crucial. And I believe we have an empathy that we should both use to our advantage. We build better products when we work closely with back-end developers because we build better products when we understand the systems involved in making it work. All of this will take some effort on our behalf, but it will be worth it. Information architects design the back end. Back end developers build it. We need each other. And that's it. Um, I, my advice would be get to know everybody on that team and get to know everything about what they do because that would be really, really helpful to you. Just understanding who you, understanding who you need to go to to find out specific things but also showing that you're interested in all of them and all of their skills and that you will value the different things that they bring to, to the work you do. It's, it's really soft skillsy, I'm sorry, but it's, I think it's helpful. Be friendly. Thank you. <laughs> Tools. I, I will use what they're using. So, um, on the on the project that I'm on at the moment, they they use Waffle and GitHub, 
So I go to them and use those tools. Is that the kind of thing that you mean? I'm sorry, I'm probably being a bit naive. Well, sometimes you try and put it down on paper. So get hard. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I feel like that was rubbish, and I pulled a joke. Save that now. <laughs> Sorry for being up in the jean suits. Um, I've just been getting involved in teams and agile sort of as a, a user and researcher and starting to read up on it. I just have a question. Uh, I, mean, I think there's words like post agile and the like, but the more I read up and learn about agile, it's actually all the things that you talk about are actually what agile is about. So is it sometimes about knowing that you know the heart of the process is about this, but because we're brought in that we're not actually aware that you know that's that sort of thing. To use the example from the start of the day, that is the best example. You know, all the things that you're going on. Yes, I think I think it sort of sometimes depends on how agile is implemented. But I think that something that it does do is really support communication um, when it's done well, and I think that that's that's really fundamental. Is that helpful? Just time for one more question. I can just shout, I'm pretty loud, so. Um, I thought your talk was really good. I would have no idea that it was your first time. It was really funny. Um, I'm working consultancy side, so I realized that sometimes we might give um, advice that isn't actually technically feasible, but we don't have developers in, in, in our company. Yeah. Um, I guess it might be useful for us to speak to developers um, Client side, um, how would you recommend starting that conversation? That's such a good question. Did everybody hear that? Um, when you're consultancy side and you don't necessarily have access to the developers, and how do you start that? I think. Well, sorry, I'm not sure if that's me whistling, but um, you you have to insist on it, whether they're client side or if they're third party. And what's on several occasions I've worked where I've been in the agency doing the kind of the UX and the front end, the client is one person or one group, and then there's a third party set back end developers. And there comes a point where that, that communication is horrific. Um, so maybe it is about finding the tools that they're using and making sure that you've got access to those tools so you can communicate to them where they're putting their work. But it's also about making sure you see them face to face. I, I can't, I know it's ridiculously soft again, but I can't emphasise enough how important it is to meet those people and prove to them that you're on their side and that you're all working together and that you need their skills. Um, I don't know, without wishing to sound petulant, you know, put your foot down, make some noise about it. Um, don't go on strike, but, you know, <laughs> insist. Is that okay? Sorry, that's really nice. All for the questions. Thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you.